This is Meredith Gilmer with the Autism Science Foundation, and today we have Dr. Jim Chalk, and he's here to talk to us at the Rockland Autism Symposium. Hi, I'm Jim Chalk. I work as a behavioral neuropsychologist for Melmark, Pennsylvania. Would you mind talking to us about the biological link between OCD and ASD? Sure. Uh, researchers have found that there's a strong biological link between individuals with autism who have obsessive compulsive symptoms and their relatives who may or may not have autism. Uh, so there's an increased incidence of obsessive compulsive symptomatology across generations and first and second degree relatives. Great. Do we know why this exists? Well, they're currently honing in on uh, particular genes and locations on genes which seem to confer risk for developing obsessive compulsive symptoms. So most likely there's probably some shared genetic factors uh, for OCD and autism. Great. Could you explain how, um, what it might look like if someone has obsessive compulsive disorder and autism and how we can differentiate the symptoms between each? Sure. The first thing I would recommend is to look at the form of the behavior. So there are certain forms of repetitive behavior in children with autism that don't look much like uh, obsessive compulsive symptomatology such as body rocking, uh, finger flicking, hand waving, those types of behaviors. Uh, at the same time there are behaviors that look more like obsessive compulsive symptomatology such as excessive hand washing, uh, excessive aligning and straightening of items. So I think the first thing to look at is whether or not the person has a form of behavior that looks like classic symptomatology seen in OCD. If it's been established that someone has OCD and autism, what would a treatment plan look like for this person? Well, first thing I'd like to mention is that uh, an important distinction is whether or not there's the same drive behind the behavior that's seen in OCD. So through our research, we found that individuals who have behaviors that look like obsessive compulsive behavior, but don't have a strong physiological uh, increasing urge to perform the behavior, do just fine with things like multiple schedules treatments, which signal availability of repetitive behavior and unavailability of repetitive behavior. However, if you have an individual who performs repetitive behavior that looks obsessive compulsive and they have that driven nature to them where they're pushing past you, uh, fighting with all their might to perform the behavior, then a tr uh, treatment that's more traditionally used with uh, individuals with OCD, such as exposure and response prevention, appears to be a better treatment at this time, although the research is uh, kind of emerging and limited at this time. You mentioned um, limits in the research. Are there limitations to these treatments that you've seen? Yes. Uh, in terms of the more traditional treatments for repetitive behavior, the signaling availability and unavailability of reinforcement or access to repetitive behavior is problematic because the individual uh, has difficulty if they have OCD as well, discontinuing behavior once it's started. So once the ball gets rolling, they have a very hard time stopping. So any signals that someone else might give them, uh, they may not be uh, as likely to respond to those signals. Uh, another limitation is that OCD is conceptualized as a disorder in which uh, increasing urges or discomfort precede repetitive behavior. So in the example of checking, uh, someone may leave their house and feel like they need to check the lock on their door. And it's a sense of dread that compels them to go back and check the lock, so a relief. So we really probably wouldn't want individuals such as that undergoing uh, treatments where they earn access to perform behaviors that really just relieve distress. Uh, the better option, I believe, in that case would be to try to just relieve the distress so they don't feel compelled to perform the behavior. Uh, so those are some limitations for the more traditional treatments for repetitive behavior. For exposure and response prevention, uh, if you're working with a patient who can communicate their distress, you would explain the treatment to them, be able to walk them through why it's important, say, to make your hands dirty and then not wash them. Uh, but for someone with autism who can't communicate or understand the therapeutic process, one of the major challenges is they have no idea why they're being exposed to these things and as a result can engage in aggression or other problematic behaviors. So the, the treatment really needs to be modified or adjusted to take the, the client's best interests in hand, uh, uh, to consider the client's best interests and develop a treatment that will address their behavior but maybe delivered in a way that's uh, more practical for someone with autism. Great. Well, thank you so much for your insight on this topic, and it's been great to have you. Sure. Thank you very much.